right, so today I am super excited to finally be working on a Toshiba brand television. Now Toshiba has been long thought of as like the fourth or fifth best possible brands for CRT televisions. And I found some really good ones, but the one we're working on today is brand new to me and it's got a flat screen. Yes, I'm talking about the Toshiba 24AF45 and this is a color television. Uh, analog only television. It's got a lot of great inputs including composite and S-Video and even a component input that Toshiba called ColorStream. So it has all the potential to be a great CRT. However, it is loaded with some problems and some secrets. So hopefully this video will help you decide if you want to get one of these televisions or if you already have one of these televisions, you'll be able to use this guide and, and this information to get the best out of your Toshiba 24AF45. Before we go into the CRT, I have to give you a big warning. This is the most dangerous television CRT line that I have ever worked on. There's a big chance that you could take a real shock from the anode cap on this CRT, so please make sure you watch this entire video before you decide to open your Toshiba 24AF45 up and try to do something inside it. Please, please, please watch this. It may save your life. Okay, so with the warning out of the way, we're gonna jump into the Toshiba 24AF45 and we're gonna reveal all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, back here in the very unattractive garage shop offloading area of Retrotech and this is where the larger CRT sit and all the back stock of parts as well as the boneyard and one of the CRTs I'm working on today is actually one of the larger ones so it, it has to stay outside for the most part and what I'm looking at today is actually this lovely Toshiba set it's a flat screen uh, standard definition analog television from the early 2000s it's got a great picture, but it definitely needs some servicing. So I'm just kind of getting the first look at this set to begin with. And the issues here are at startup, we have some glitching on the screen. This set has a nice amount of inputs. We've got uh, what's called color stream from Toshiba, but that's actually our component video. It does have a composite video out. We have composite video in and S video, which is the signal I've been testing. And of course we have RF. Uh, on the front of the set, there's a trap door with another set of composite video inputs and then an audio jack for headphones. Very sleek design on this Toshiba. Inside our set, we actually have a pretty simple chassis design. Obviously, this is our neck board and then our anode cap right there, which we will discharge in a second. This is a quick look at the deflection yoke right there. And then these are our convergence and purity adjustment rings right there. And if we look around, there's only a few connections, so this should be pretty easy to get apart and put together. We've got our degaussing cable right here and our power input. And then we've got our deflection yoke connection right here. And this up here is just to our speakers, so we can disconnect that and we will pull everything all together. I'll pull the neck board with the chassis after I discharge it, but let's just get ready though to discharge the tube. All right, we've come to the dangerous part and you're gonna see me discharge this tube, but I need to warn you, the way I discharge this tube is probably not the best way for this CRT. I'm doing it the way to kind of protect the hardware, but this particular Toshiba does not have any kind of bleeder resistor built into the anode system at all. So when you go in and you discharge this CRT, you are always going to get a large spark. There will always be a large discharge of electricity. So just be prepared for that. All right, so back to the zap. So we've got this nice big ground strap on this set and we can just plug into it right there. Then we are going to discharge this thing right up here um, at the cap. I'm gonna remove the cap first and then we'll discharge everything afterwards. Oh, I hear some, you hear that? 
possible electricity in there. I'm hearing some in that cap right there. Let's see. Oh, did you hear that? It flipped over. There was definitely some electricity still there. There's still electricity right there. I could have zapped myself, so there's always that chance. Well, let's just see if anything happens when I touch the actual anode cap. Oh, I hear it. You hear it? Ooh! <laughs> we did get a zap right there. Wow. Do it again just to make sure. I didn't really see anything, but I definitely had a zap there on this tube. And we'll discharge this thing a couple more times. I'm going to let it sit and then re-discharge it. But that was pretty... That's pretty wild. You normally don't see that on professional stuff, but that, that should be a big warning to anybody who's ever messed around with consumer sets, even these high-end ones like from Toshiba. You could have really gotten yourself zapped on there. It's a pretty large tube. Well, I'm down here in my shop and I've finished servicing the main circuit board. I'm about to show that to you. So here's our main board. And this area over here is the power supply area. So this was serviced uh, as well as this area and other power supply parts. Here, these are our deflection capacitors. So all these in this zone and this and that area. And there's a couple back in here. All that was serviced. And then same thing with the neck board. That's what I consider to be the vital parts. Uh, the rest of the board is not in high temperature areas except for the stereo audio amp. And that's all those caps tested out fine. Now, one more thing I had to do was the solder on this. I, I talked about this more in a stream I did where I worked on this board and made the cap kit, but this is a lead-free board. It's marked on all the boards where it says PB, it says right there, PB free. I don't know if you could see that down there where my thumb is, but it says PB free right there. So this board was soldered with solder that didn't have any lead in it, and now since it's been about 20 years since this solder was fresh uh, it's definitely gotten some corrosion and it doesn't look good uh, it's oxidized so i've gone through and reflowed all the solder on both boards and that's something you may have to do that may be more important than the cap kit on this particular toshiba however if you do want the cap kit i will publish this cap kit over to my patreon discord page so that's where you can find the cap kit um, this has been cleaned and resoldered, and the capacitors are fresh and now we can go stick this back in the tube and actually test it. All right, guys, excuse the poor audio. I'm sure you're capturing a lot of that sound from the CRT. I've got it fired back up down here. I've plugged in my standard video source. Everything is going okay. Um, we got her powered on, and I'm just kind of letting it do its thing here for a minute. You notice we are still getting a little bit of jitters over here. And this would happen the first time I turned the CRT on, but... After it warmed up for like 30 minutes, it stopped doing it. So I'm not exactly sure. Um, obviously, whatever we did, it did not fix this problem fully. And it may be something with the tube or flyback. Uh, we'll have to sit here and monitor it. I'm going to let it run for a good half an hour, and then we'll see how it looks. It's still doing it a little bit right there. Um, we'll give it some more time. We'll come back and check. And hopefully after the CRT has completely warmed up for a half an hour. Hopefully these squiggly lines will stop. All right, well, it's been over an hour, and unfortunately, I'm still seeing the disruption and interference here, even beyond a standard warm-up time. So this might be something where this flyback is just on its last leg. Now, before I completely give up on this set, I'm going to pull the circuit board another time and we'll check out all those other areas on the main board that may still have some bad soldering or bad solder joints all right i'm gonna connect it to my ground strap i'm not touching anything metal we're gonna try to get under this cap and see if we can get a, a zap oh i heard it All right, so check out this. I've reflowed solder on this board, uh, but I don't think it's going to probably make much of a difference. What I see here is a Samsung flyback transformer, but the issue right here is this is a phase three lead-free flyback transformer. So I have to think for sure that what is happening here is the lead-free solder is degrading and breaking down within this flyback transformer. 
And that's really... That's really bad news. Alright, I just installed the circuit board again and we're still seeing the issues on here with the vibrating edges and center and then you'll see sometimes the image will swell and brightness will change where it'll go a little bit brighter and then back to darker and I just believe that it all has to do with that flyback transformer. Lots of jitters. Well, it was about this point that I was ready to throw in the towel and just give up on this Toshiba. However, I started to troubleshoot a little bit more and I noticed that as I turned up the screen's brightness and contrast to above normal standards, it would actually balance out the tube and we no longer had the distortion along the sides of the edges. I've managed to make the image a little bit more stable by increasing the brightness and the contrast up to the levels above 45. I've got contrast at 48, brightness at 46. And by doing that, it's almost stabilized the picture and it's helping that flyback uh, produce a more consistent image. Now it does look a bit bloomed out, you might say, or there's a little bit too much um, screen. Like if you have an all dark screen, for example, if your screen's all dark it doesn't actually show dark but when you turn it down to the proper darkness level and blackness level it's going to cause the flyback to start to sh shake and do all the things that you saw before because now the screen's looking really good after just a short warm-up time but you see how that is you still see a kind of gray show through that and that is just because the brightness is up a bit too high, but that's the way the TV likes it, so we're gonna leave it like that. Our Toshiba has been powered off all night and it is early morning. I'm gonna power everything on. And again, this is a full cold Toshiba. We're gonna see if any distortion happens along the edge from the cold point of starting it because I do still think we're going to need some time to warm up. You see the screen comes into place like that. Let's pull up our arrows. My goodness, look at that. Dead cold CRT and we're not having any wiggling. So we'll just keep monitoring this, but it looks good. All right, the set's been running for a while now and I still have a consistent line here. I didn't have a single time where it glitched at all. I didn't have any of the brightness issues. It, once it turned on and you saw it come alive, that was the only brightness thing where it kind of blooms up and gets its size right. Since then, it's run perfectly. All right, so we were able to solve that problem with the jittering screen and after I set the, the brightness and contrast at the levels I showed you, I didn't have a single issue. However, this is one of the ugly parts of this television. You have to almost have it a little bit bloomed out in picture and have the brightness over amplified, thus getting you pretty dull blacks. I mean, you're really ending up with a more of a gray than a black. The second ugly thing about this CRT is all the lead-free solder on the boards and in the flyback. That's the first time I've ever seen lead-free phase three flyback uh, transformer and I don't really have a lot of confidence in it. So those materials will break down quicker than the capacitors. The capacitors on this board were all Rubicon and pretty good in quality. Not many of them had failed. So that's something you need to consider with this 24 AF 45 is the fact that you're going to deal with lead-free solder more than likely on your circuit board. So let's talk about some of the secrets now of this Toshiba and we should start with how to access some of the additional features that are available. First off this is done by getting into the service menu and to do that you will need the remote control for this television set. Now to access the menu, all you need to do is hold down the volume button 
on the TV set itself, and then you hold down the number nine on the remote. And when you hold those down long enough, eventually the service menu will just pop up. And this service menu is pretty simple to navigate. You just use the up and down arrows on your remote control and the left and right arrows to make changes. And then once you make a change, you just move on to the next thing or exit out of the menu and it saves the last setting that was input into it. So if you're concerned about making changes, I will warn you, you should go through and maybe record what each of the levels are to begin with. Um, some of the things in there you may not want to, uh, want to adjust. So just be mindful of what you're adjusting in that service menu. There's also a second secret and cool thing of this CRT, and that is that it has an hours counter. And the way to access this hours counter is again to hold down the volume button on the TV set and then take the remote control and also hold down the number six button. And after a few seconds, the counter will pop up on the screen that shows you how many hours are on your CRT. So how about one more secret? This Toshiba set has a velocity modulation package included in the hardware. Toshiba has designed a special part on this set to hopefully give you edge sharpening. This edge sharpening just makes the edges of the picture appear sharper than they normally would. So this velocity modulation coil is connected to the neck board through a simple connection cable and it appears the only way on this set to disable this feature is to unplug it. So let's do some testing now, take a look at the edges with the velocity modulation and then without the velocity modulation and decide which looks best. All right, the velocity modulator is engaged right now and we're gonna take a look at our monoscope pattern a little bit closer. If you look up in this area, we'll see a lot of hooking going on. It's really pronounced in these corners and then this edge area. You'll see some hooking and you'll also notice, again, the line is just not completely straight. It looks very sharp, but at the same time, it may be showing more than we want it to in these corners. Check out just the line and how kind of indents everywhere. It's really not straight enough. See, it's really squiggly. The only way to disengage this is to disconnect this cable right here. Just like that, the mode is turned off and we'll check out the screen and see if it looks any better. Well, this is what the screen looks like without that velocity modulator. So let's go in closer to these corners and see if we still see the extra pronounced hooking. I noticed that a lot of that has kind of been blended out in these corners. There is still a little bit of misshapenness here, but it's not nearly as pronounced as it was with that mode engaged. Still does look wonky. See, I'm still getting that corner hitch right there. However, it does soften up some of the parts, but it hasn't removed every little hitch on the screen. It looks smoother, a little bit smoother, but we still have these hitches that are gonna be part of this flat screen tube. When you have the velocity modulation engaged, it does improve the sharpness of the edges, but it also results in poorer geometry, and that softer edge actually looks better to me personally. Now let's take a look at some 240p gameplay footage from the Super Nintendo, and we're using component, and we're using the HD RetroVision high quality component cables here. My SNES has been modified with the Voltar RGB amplifier, and it has been recapped. I'm using a triad power supply, so all the parts here are in good shape. Let's just see how this looks on screen. Well, I can't really sugarcoat this. This screen does not look amazing in component, uh, mainly because of the blooming look you get from having to crank up that contrast and brightness on this tube and flyback. The resulting image just looks a little bit more washed out. It's extremely difficult to film this CRT, especially since it's flat and it's got all the light issues with the over blooming picture. So it looks even worse on camera than it would in person. Uh, but for the most part, this is not a great CRT to be using in a very dark room. 
The image will look better in a brighter environment, so if you have a lot of lights on or if you're in a room with a lot of sunlight, that high brightness and contrast on the tube will actually make the image show through better. So yeah, all in all, it's not a great picture on this tube compared to many other CRTs that are out there, especially other consumer CRTs. All right, after completing this amazing restoration and reviewing this TV set and finding out all the secrets, I want to give it a letter grade. Now, this letter grade is just like in school. It's going to go from A plus down to an F. And for the Toshiba 24AF45, my final grade is a C minus. This television seems to have as many negative qualities as positive qualities. Let's talk about the positive qualities first. First off, you do have good inputs. So you have composite, component, S-Video, RF. The service menu is a plus, And the hours counter is always a plus on a CRT. However, there is a pretty big stack of negative features to this television. First off, from a hardware perspective, it doesn't have the most amazing tube. It's an Orion tube combined with a flyback that is a phase three lead free flyback transformer and that combination of parts probably would have never held up longer than say a trinitron tube with a nice high quality flyback from sony if you look at the circuit boards really the problem there is the solder again this lead free solder it's just troublesome it breaks down quicker than solder with a little bit of lead in it and that is always going to be an issue for this hardware the other negative thing is you need a remote control to really do anything with this set so that's kind of a drawback and finally the image quality is just not like top notch you can get a better looking picture from a curved screen i just don't give it the greatest picture quality due to the blooming look and the fact that it's a flat screen CRT with limited geometry controls, you end up with some wonkiness along the edges. And no matter what you do, you're never really going to get that geometry looking perfect or near perfect like you can with a broadcast or a professional level CRT. All right, so that's it. That's harsh enough on this Toshiba 24AF45. I'm glad to finally be done working on it. I do like the television set, but personally, I'm not going to add it to my list of things I'm going to add to my personal collection. Maybe a 14-incher I could add to the collection, but the 24-inch is just too big, and there's too many downsides for it for me personally to like. But what do you think about it? Do you have one of these sets? Have you been using it for a while? What's your opinions of it? Do you disagree with me and actually love this television? I'd really enjoy hearing your opinion in the comments below. Lastly, I'd like to say thank you to all the Patreon members out there who support this channel and all my work I do every month. Um, if you want more information on Patreon, you can definitely check out the link I have pinned in the description as well as a comment down there in the comment section. But that's going to do it. If you enjoyed it, please just do me the small favor of clicking the like button. And I will see you all next time for another massive, wonderful CRT restoration and review. Oh, Cole. There are more bad issues with this television. If you do not... No. Snorlax, why don't you go on out of here? I love you. All right. Come on, get out of here. You're going to snore. Go, go.